There's four basic phases for product development. The first one is you've got an idea, you've got a concept. And at that point, you're going to be coming to a conference like this, you're going to be learning about the technology, you're going to be taking small steps to understanding what you can do. So you understand that I can discover devices, I can work out what those devices do, I understand that we've got these services and characteristics and there's these service specifications and profile specifications and I can do all sorts of things and I can do the profiles on my application on my phone platform and I can do my um, services on my little device that I'm going to build and sell for lots of money and make myself a billionaire. Then you're going to have to prototype it. And prototyping is where you build a design based on that concept. Then you need to test that so you can test your prototype, not only to make sure that it works, but make sure it is compliant with the Bluetooth specifications. Because once it is compliant with the Bluetooth specifications, you can then qualify that. And what that really means is that you list your device and your product and declare that you think that your device is compliant with the Bluetooth specification. And the good thing about that is that you can then use the Bluetooth brand with that product. You can promote that product in association with Bluetooth. So that is a huge benefit for going through all of this process. One of the key parts of this is something called an implementation conformance statement, an X. So an implementation conformance statement, what that basically says is, in my implementation, I am building this functionality. I'm building the functionality that says, I do X, I do Y, I do Z. And then by doing that, you can then determine what tests you need to run based off something called a test case mapping table. So the test specifications define the test structures, the sequence charts that you need to do, the procedures to, to, to check conformance and interoperability of your Bluetooth design. And this test case mapping table maps the test cases that you need based off your X. So for example, if you're building a proximity sensor, and you therefore need to implement those three services that I mentioned. The TX power service, the immediate alert service, and the uh, link loss alert service. So your X will have a tick. Yes, I'm going to implement those three. And then you'll get a list of tests that you need to, to do. All of this is based around something called a test case reference list. The test case reference list is a list of all the tests in the Bluetooth SIG, and those tests are what you have to do. Those tests have different categories. So you have category A, category B, category C, category D, category X. And if there's an errata on one of those test cases, then instead of holding up everybody's product, they just go down a level of test requirement. Um, and then some of them you have to supply evidence. Some of them you have to use a test facility to collect that evidence. And some of them you actually have to have a fully qualified uh, Bluetooth test lab. Once you've done all of that, once you've run all the tests, you can then go into the qualification phase. So the result of all of this is to list your device and product on the Bluetooth SIG website. That means that everybody on the planet can see that your device is a Bluetooth compliant product. The whole process of this is very, very simple. First of all, you need a QDID. A QDID is just a number, and it's a reference number that is unique for your design. That, unfortunately, costs a little bit of money. But compared to the amount of money that you're going to spend to develop the software and stuff like that, it's a very small amount of money. Once you've got that QDID, then you complete your test plan, you upload the test results to the Bluetooth SIG website, and then you use what is known as the test plan generator to match those test results with that QDID, and you have uh, also something called a compliance folder. So the compliance folder is effectively either an electronic folder or a physical folder where you collect all of the test evidence and how you conducted the test, what hardware you, did you use, what software did you use, all of the normal sort of things to document how you qualified that device. And then you store that away safely 
for the lifetime that you're going to sell that product and up to three years after that. Once you've got all of that, then you fill in a QDL, a qualified design listing, and then an end product listing or an EPL. And that's it. It's, it's, it actually is fairly, fairly simple. The other thing that you can do is you can brand your device. So one of the key questions we keep getting is, how do I know if my device can be called a smart device or a smart ready device? Well, it's very, very simple. A smart device is something that is compliant with a set of requirements. So you need to be compliant with the low energy core configuration. In other words, you have to have a low energy radio in your system. So that's the RFI, the link layer, as well as L2CAP, Security Manager, GAP, AT, and GAT. Say GAP and GAT. And at that point, you are a smart device. You're a Bluetooth smart device. You can use the Bluetooth smart logo as seen up at the top right. If you're a smart ready device, then you have to do the BR and LE combined core configuration. So here, you have to do the RF baseband and LMP from BREDR, as well as the RF phi and link layer from LE, as well as L2CAP, SDP, SM, GAP, AT, and GAT. Once you've got all of those, then you can call yourself a smart ready device. Now, there are a couple of extra rules like you have to have downloadable software so you can update the software so that, for example, when a new profile comes out, you can download new software to allow that profile to work. But fundamentally, this is what you need. So are there any questions that people have? The only question I have really is uh, electrical testing. How does that come to play with Bluetooth uh, qualification? So the Bluetooth qualification only covers what you need for compliance with the core specifications and the profile specifications. So electrical testing, regulatory testing, uh, you know, EC marks and uh, things like that are not within the scope of Bluetooth. So while you can have, for example, a qualified Bluetooth design, that doesn't mean that you can actually sell that design in, for example, Europe without a CE mark. So that CE mark, the regulatory testing, is additional to any Bluetooth qualification testing. The, the idea here is that the Bluetooth qualification testing is as small as possible. We don't try to make it as big as possible and cover everything. Okay, any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you.